Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Coffee Science Seminar Series. If we can have the uh, next slide, Scott. Thanks, Scott. So my name is Graham Hammer. Um, I'm a professor in crop science in the Centre for Crop Science in Coffee, and it's my pleasure to facilitate today's seminar. Um, if we can just move to the acknowledgement of country before we get started. So University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So if we move to the next slide, Scott. So before I introduce Scott, just a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, the presentation, the seminar is designed to go from 12 to one. Um, we will hopefully have plenty of time for question and answer at the end of Scott's presentation. Please make sure you use the Q&A tab if you want to ask any questions and I'll monitor those during the talk and put the questions to Scott at the end of his, at the end of his presentation. Um, it's my, my pleasure today to introduce Scott. Um, I've known Scott for a long time. In fact, he worked with me in Queensland Department of Prime Industries in 1990s. Uh, so how far back we go, working in some crop physiology and modeling tasks. He then moved to, to some postdoctoral work at CIMIT, came back and had a long career at CSIRO uh, Agriculture before moving across as the current position in Professor in Crop Physiology in the School of Agriculture and Food Sciences. So today we're very pleased to have his uh, presentation on um, data science. So I'll hand it over to you, Scott, to deliver that presentation. Okay. Thanks, Graham, for the introduction. Indeed, it does go back some time. Um, I too like with would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. I'm in different lands to, to Graham and pay my respect to their ancestors and their descendants. So please, I uh, warn everybody that I'm actually running this off my phone. So if we have some dramas, I apologize. We'll try to recover from that if it eventuates, but hopefully we won't because my 4G is better than the university internet at Gatton Bay. Um, I did have a, a fairly uh, ambitious title, I suppose, and I don't know whether it was, I thought I just wanted to try to use this seminar to engage a few more people outside of agriculture and also to help some of our people in agriculture to think more about data science and how that might impact on us and what the opportunities are for research. So I'm hoping a few of my colleagues around UQ and elsewhere who work in data science have been able to join us. I see we've got a bit over 100 participants, so there's a few there. Um, the subtitle there is, is more what I'm going to focus on, but that's mainly because that's the type of research that I do. And I want to take examples from that, but I have a few extra things at the end that I'm, I'm going to add into that. So I did also want to point out, I've had a pretty recent adventure in, um, <coughs> in data science. Um, I was phoned up by the head of the Queensland AI Hub, um, Sue, Sue Kay, uh, which is a recently formed group uh, of, and, and UQ is a founding member of the AI Hub, and it's a, it's a group of interested institutions and companies, uh, the Queensland government, and the idea is to promote um, AI technologies. And Sue phoned me up and asked me if I would partner with a, an artist, this uh, Mad Madeline Holt, um, who's a young street artist in Brisbane, and help her design an, a mural, um, which is now at the Gregory Terrace RNA showground. Now, I have to say, I didn't get, I don't ha claim terribly much originality for for the inspiration in the mural, maybe the inspiration, 
um, Madeline and I sat down and we, we went through a whole lot of some of the data that you'll see today. And she put that into her own style and, and you can see that she's built a really nice stylized mural that kind of represents landscapes and views that we have of landscapes and, and the ways that we think about um, focusing our science to interpret the underlying um, adaptation of, of crops and, and um, on landscapes. So anyway, I'd encourage you to go and have a look at it if you get a chance. And there's a lot of other interesting murals nearby. So if you don't like ours, um, you can look at some others. So <clears throat> this isn't really a science talk. There's a bit of science in it, but a lot of scientists might be a bit disappointed um, because I won't be talking about any super new stuff. It's more about a domain um, discussion uh, to try to engage more with the mass IT data science audience. So I hope there's a few of you uh, being able to join us and, and also an opportunity for ag scientists to think about the needs for data sciences in the ag and, and the way in which the way we do research is, is changing. It may even be the case that we, we need to do this to ensure that our future career prospects, although some of we older people, I suppose, may not have to worry about too much, but the next generation certainly will. And I'll make some comments about that near the end. I'm mostly interested in trying to work out how to combine technologies and it gives me the opportunity to work with different people in different fields. I work mostly in these areas of sort of phenotyping and crop growth modeling. So for those data scientists, phenotyping is really the application of a lot of measurement technologies from remote, well, from proximal sensing to physical observation. So using your eyes to, to score plots in the field and, and making observations about the differences between those. So research trials typically consist of large numbers of plots that are, are small, that are, you know, 10, five to 10 square meters in size for most crops. And there might be hundreds of those plots in a field. And we're using a lot of different technologies to document how they change over time. And phenotyping has really taken off in the last, I guess, 10 to 15 years when we've had a lot of digital technologies that can help us measure things with LIDARs, with um, cameras, with various other technologies I'll talk about. Crop growth modeling is something that we have a long experience in at, at UQ as one of the founding partners of the APSIM initiative. You can look that up on APSIM.a, um, what is it? Oh, info, sorry, APSIM.info. I should have put it up there. Uh, it's the cropping systems uh, model that UQ has developed with a lot of other partners. Um, originally CSIRO and the Queensland Government, but now it includes Iowa State University, USQ and New Zealand Ag and Food. So there are many collaborators involved in that um, initiative and crop growth modelling gets used a lot throughout farming systems and, and plant breeding, which is more the area that I work on. More recently, I've started to work a little bit more in remote sensing. Um, particular at UQ, Andres Potgier has a very long history in this, working with Graham um, in yield forecasting and for, for the nation, for wheat um, and for sorghum. And we're now looking a lot more at using this technology uh, at an experiment level. So trying to understand how variation occurs in the field. And to do this, we need to go back and look at statistics, math and machine learning to help us. So, Statistics is still the background, or I should have said the backbone of, of ag research. So experiment design, classic analysis, ANOVA and mixed models, um, estimation of genotype performance and, and various types of linear and nonlinear model fitting. These technologies are, are pretty important to us to understand every experiment that we do. But there's an increasing interest in using machine learning and deep learning techniques to more deeply understand some of the aspects of what we're measuring with these digital technologies that allow us to measure a lot more, many, a greater number of things, but also allowing us to do mega experiments where we combine data across large numbers of sites. And that includes uh, 
analyzing data from, from farms themselves or from fields themselves or from parts of fields. So one way that we've looked at this in the past, and I'm referring to this uh, article that I was wrote with um, Fred Van Awick and Daniela Bustos Courts at um, Bargaining and University, the ongoing collaborations with them in this space, is thinking about how do we bring these technologies together. And we, we wrote a bit about some of that in this paper a couple of years ago, and I've kind of used the feature extraction, spatial modeling, dynamic modeling framework to, to talk about some of the issue, the opportunities that we have in data science. So if you go to that paper, there's this nice table that summarizes some of the issues that we're trying to deal with, um, thinking about these different modeling steps. So they're all different types of modeling. Uh, we can use that rather than learning if we want to. And feature extraction comes into the picture when we think about how do we extract information from either imagery data or from very complex uh, amounts of of data that's come from, for example, uh, spectroscopy scans uh, in the field. So you might still be using point data, it doesn't have to be image data, but you're trying to extract features from that information. Uh, spatial modeling is a very important part of, of research experimentation because we're trying to adjust for local variability in the field. Uh, Australia's had a long history in that space, partly because our soils are so ancient. So, and our rainfall is typically low. So when you run experiments in Australia, an experiment might be somewhere between a half a hectare and you know, five hectares in size. Because of the geological age of our continent, uh, the, the soils are highly eroded and they tend to be highly variable. So there, there are not many places where you won't have some variation in soil type on a scale of sort of meters to tens of meters to hundreds of meters. Um, some of our research farms, we try to locate them where there's less of that variation. So, you know, there are parts of our farm here at Gatton that are quite uniform, but there are other parts that are quite variable. And so spatial modelling to account for this becomes important. And in Australian environments, particularly important because we're growing things under low rainfall conditions and that really exposes this soil variability. If you're in high rainfall environments, you don't see so much of that variability. Um, dynamic modelling is, is the type of modelling we start to think about from a crop physiology point of view when we're trying to capture information about how plants grow in environments and predict their performance into the future. So feature extraction is the sort of first topic I wanted to skip through. And two of the technologies we use to do this are UAVs and um, tractors that have been outfitted with various sensors. I won't go through them in detail. You can see here there are cameras and LIDARs and spectral sensors. Um, Andres uh, Potkeeter in particular, who's online, and I think uh, Barbara Ball, George Degley, and a, a few of the other people who were really involved in developing and using this, this tractor, which you can come and see out at um, Warwick at the moment, although hopefully we'll get it down to Gatton shortly because we intend to use it in some trials uh, this coming winter. But this machine is set up in ways to measure at resolutions of centimetres, um, changes in spectral reflectance, um, imagery and, and the condition of these plants. And then we aggregate that up and process that information. Um, this is a slide from Andres on the Gecko Explorer, which is a tool which is built around the data that comes out of this system and also out of the UAVs. And there's a lot of um, opportunities for machine learning applications in that. So for any data science students out there looking for some more work to do, we certainly have a lot of challenges in, in just simply handling and processing this data and efficiently applying unsupervised learning methods to, to understand what we've got. So thinking about variability, here's a, a shot of a uh, a weed experiment. This is a kind of trial you might see in, in um, the drier parts of our wheat belt. Um, these are trials that are yielding sort of two to four tonnes per hectare. So that's not very much um, seed. It's only 
200 to 400 grams per square meter uh, when you harvest that. So when you see these plants, they don't look too spectacular, but sometimes you see things that are a bit more distressing and there's this variability that you see in the field that's been caused by some kind of a soil effect. And in a high rainfall environment, you might not see this at all. It may not have affected the establishment of these plants, but in these situations it has. So one of the approaches used for this is uh, splining methodology. So um, this is one of the key algorithms that's underlying some of the work done in bargaining and um, who we partner with. And the, the team there working from technologies that were developed by Paul Ellers for um, um, ecology have developed a, an, um, an R library called SPATS, which is able to fit this spatial effect and also allow us to extract the treatment information. So in, in these types of trials, the treatments are genotypes and so there'll be several replicates of those plots, two or three, usually two or three copies of those of any particular genotype, uh, not necessarily. I mean, there's a lot of range in experiment design, but in, in some of the trials we're looking at, there are two to three um, copies. And this is the raw data that you might see in such a trial for yield, um, the residuals. You can see there's a, a spatial trend there from uh, lower yields in the corner to high yields on one side. And the idea is to use this software to try and remove those trend effects. But a more important thing for us is to think about uh, whether we can incorporate this phenotyping information. So that yield has been measured with a harvester, but how do we incorporate some of the things that we might have observed during the season, so this variability in spatial cover. And we can, we can fit that information as long as it doesn't have a genotypic effect, if it's a, if it's a true independent effect, then we can start to accommodate that and include it as a, a covariate in our analysis. And in this case, and this is a fairly extreme case, but the ground cover accounted for 52% of the yield variation that we saw at the end of the, the season. This is a fairly straightforward application, but of course, some of the times we probably should abandon these trials rather than risk them. But the same piece blind techniques are being used at smaller scales. So one of the things that we can do and this is a terrible example. I, I think this is a trial that we pretty much should abandon or would abandon. Um, but because we're starting to use these image techniques from drones and collecting this information, we can actually start to analyze data by within the plots, which is not something we would normally do. I mean, normally you would have yield data as a, as a measurement for the whole plot, or you may have a score that a breeder might have made by walking down the rows at some point and giving this a score between one and nine and using that information as a, as a covariate potentially. But with uh, this kind of image analytics, we are able to um, partition these plots and start to try to model that variability and see if we can try to uh, remove that effect from the uh, the yield data that we can observe at the end of the season. And we can also go the other way. So this is from some work that um, we're doing with, with Daniela. Um, Corinne Chenou is also involved in this um, project. But we've actually been using piece blinds at larger scales. So we're actually running computer simulations at all of these sites and we're simulating um, breeding trials. And then we're trying to use that information to see if we can um, interpolate yield performance across those areas. Now, that's leaving us with a, a lot of other challenges because that can work for accommodating variability in weather, but where we've got soil changes between them, then we have to think about how do we deal with discontinuities that occur in that kind of way. So the rainfall, across this region is, is higher on the east and, and lower on the, as you go further west. So when you get to Walgut, you have lower rainfall. So this gradient is, is kind of what you'd expect. Um, and in mild years, so we classified these years over time, these are simulations, so they've been run over multiple years. But in mild years, we see this fairly smooth trend that's related to rainfall, so higher yields in the east, lower yields in the, in the west. 
But when we start to look at hot years, so where there are more severe drought conditions or there are heat Im impacts on the, on the yield, it starts to um, illustrate more variability across the region. And that's actually starting to expose the, the effects of a shallow soil in Walgett compared to better soils in the east, for example. So we're applying these techniques at different scales. Um, the second area of feature extraction is to inform dynamic models. So I'm not going to go through this spaghetti diagram, which I have to admit um, designing in, in R, but this is a, a, a diagram of how our deterministic crop models work. So taking environment inputs and some parameters that are specified usually at a genotype level, and certainly at a species level, and then estimating phenology, so development through the season, expansion processes of leaf, of canopies and roots, which are things that gather resources for plants to grow, uh, capturing those resources and then converting it to biomass and grain yield. So we're interested in different parts of this pathway and how we can analyze that and what techniques we need to, uh, to apply to it. So what kind of phenotyping techniques can we apply to estimating these parameters for phenology, leaf area, and radiation use efficiency, for example. So in, in these kinds of models, we're trying to actually back calculate what these parameters might mean in um, different genotypes. So we want to be able to estimate how they vary in their leaf appearance rate. So this is kind of a fundamental phenotypic trait um, and how they might differ in their radiation use efficiency, which I'll mention again later, which is a, an efficiency of conversion of light to, to carbohydrates um, for, for growth and how this all influences the amount of light that they intercept and the biomass they can produce. So this is some work that we've done with um, Purdue University as part of an R4E project. Um, and in that, we're looking at diverse um, sorghums and we're actually doing very similar work here in Australia. So Barbara, George Shakley and Andres um, are particularly involved in, in this work in Australia and um, applying similar approaches to this. Um, but what we're trying to do is work out whether we can use some of these technologies to characterize leaf number, leaf size um, uh, patterns and use that to estimate leaf area over time. And then we're wanting to try to work out the relationship between leaf area and light interception. And finally, by calculating light interception over time and accumulating that over time, uh, we compare that to the biomass that's observed. So we can't do all of this completely remotely yet. Um, some of these things we have to do by taking measurements on single plants, but some of that might involve taking plants out of the field and scanning them with cameras to um, estimate some of these things like the leaf area distribution. But we're working towards this, but the thing is, the important thing from this diagram is really to think about this as a driver for um, how do we apply our phenology, how do we apply the techniques that we're using to derive these particular parameters. So this is a sort of a <clears throat> a one genotype at a time approach. Um, these are the modelled um, leaf area profiles, excuse me, <clears throat> for different hybrids of sorghum. Um, and then we can look at how those profiles change over time. So this is the leaf area index estimated over time and comparisons of our models with um, observed data. Um, these are estimates of the light extinction coefficient. So this is how much light a uh, canopy can capture uh, given a certain amount of leaf area. So plants with leaves in different orientations can catch different amounts of, of light as it comes through the canopy. They catch it in different ways and that changes their efficiency. And so eventually what you're aiming to do is, is to predict biomass over time. So this, is, this project is around sorghum biomass production um, for bioenergy applications. And these simulations are observed versus simulated predictions for different genotypes across a range of environments in Texas and in the Midwest. So we apply a series of techniques in our, 
and our deterministic models to try and estimate these parameters, but we're doing it one at a time um, to, to make these predictions. So one thing I did want to mention is, is a slide that, that Mark Cooper gave me um, from the work of, of Frank Technow and, and Mark and Charlie Messina in particular at, at Corteva. And this is a, another area of data science which is becoming very critical to our research and, and is certainly being deployed in the new ARC Centre for Plant Success at UQ. And this type of modelling allows us to try to do all genotypes at once. So thinking about how parameters are linked by genetics and applying hierarchical Bayesian generalised linear models that have been filtered through a crop model. So this is a, a slightly simpler version of, of the APSIM crop model. But what you're trying to do is simultaneously fit these parameters that I talked about for these types of parameters that I talked about for which we've done one genotype at a time. You're trying to fit them all at once, but you're using the observed information in the field, but additionally you're using the genetic information to help you make those those um, parameter estimations. And Alex Wu, who's a DECRA uh, fellow at, at Coffee, is also working on this, uh, applying this kind of methodology, again, working with Mark and the Corteva team as well, and, and with Graham Hammer. And he's taking a similar kind of approach to try to dissect um, photosynthesis rate. So this is the rate of photosynthesis of a, of a leaf in response um, to changes in, well, in response to internal carbon dioxide concentration. I won't explain all of that, but you can disassemble uh, photosynthesis into two different pathways. And what Alex and the team are working on in that project is feeding a model um, like this, well, into uh, a Bayesian fitting process and being able to use a series of structured data sets um, to try to fit those parameters. But the idea of using the Bayesian approach is that with um, a physiological model behind it and trying to fit all of those parameters simultaneously, you can do this with that kind of approach with a much smaller data set than you would need to use if you tried to do it all independently. And the other thing that it helps us deal with is, is the correlation amongst all the traits. If you tried to do it in a linear regression framework, it's almost, well, it is impossible to do with the, the data sets that we collect. But you can talk to Alex about that and I'll reference his, um, his coffee talk at the end of this. Um, the last point I wanted to say about um, model fitting is that the same kind of piece blown spine approaches um, that I mentioned earlier are also being used in our phenotyping work. So when we're trying to um, reinterpret these um, signals that we see in the field, so these are estimates of, of biomass change over time. These actually come from simulated data sets. But if you measure plants frequently in the field, you'll see these bumps in, in, the, uh, in the way that they grow, if you think about this as crop growth rate through the season. And we've been using the piece blind approaches to try to smooth this data before we put it into the next stage of analysis, whether that's through a Bayesian fitting process or whether it's through some other um, approach. Um, the other point, of, well, on the um, estimation of cover, so when we're thinking about how much light interception there is in these um, systems, so trying to think about how light's penetrating and estimating the fractional cover in these um, trials. Another approach we're using in wheat is to put fixed cameras in the field. So we're basically, we're watching grass grow. It's not terribly exciting, but we're watching wheat grow actually. And these are images coming from about 50 cameras that we had across the country last year. So these cameras are trail cams and they're watching wheat grow. But by analysing this at a particular angle, it happens to be 45 degrees, but we can calculate the leaf area index of these plants. So 
we binarize the image, we apply a decision tree approach that, that we published and I'm working with a team in the University of Tokyo. And that allows us to estimate the cover over time through the season. Some of these cameras went in a bit late. This year we we're trying to get them in right at the start of planning. But it allows us to track cover of a reference plot in the field, which we can then relate to our remote sensing data um, from satellite. So that covers some of the machine learning related to kind of parameter estimation in crop growth modeling. And I think you can see there's quite a bit of expertise in, in, in UQ in, in both fitting that on a per genotype basis, but but also as illustrated by the work of Mark Cooper and his team in, in using more sophisticated methods to, to link that with genetic data in, in these situations. Um, I wanted to mention some other work that we're doing um, on head counting. So um, we've been doing this kind of work for a few years now, and, and this has been in conjunction with Andres, but this is out of a new project that we're doing with colleagues in France and, and Tokyo, and also using some data sets from Purdue. Um, and so this is a more classic uh, feature extraction, if you like, or object extraction. So we're trying to count these heads of sorghum. These are aerial views of plots that are about four meters long, and these are different genotypes of sorghum or different views. And we're applying various types of classic uh, models that people in data science would be familiar with. We're either using detection-based models or density-based models, and we're comparing their performance and, and how well they transfer to a generalization set. And what we find is that the network models don't always fit better than the, the map-based ones. If you, if you tune them, these density map models, which are essentially big regression models, uh, complex regression models, do a better job on the test sets, but as soon as you start to push them into other generalization sets, so this is a generalization set, we've trained it on data that looks like this, and then we're trying to predict these, we start to get failure. So these are failing badly. In the test sets, we're underestimating in images of about 100 heads, we're only estimating two, un underestimating by two or three heads, but when we take it to a really tough challenge of very different pictures, we underestimate by 20 heads out of 120. So we're, we're not picking them all up. So with the French team, um, we're working on ways of trying to improve this. And one of the ways that we're doing that is to use um, GAN approaches, so generalized adversarial models, which again, data science people will be familiar with. But here are some slides from, from our team at UQ, that Crispin and James and um, Yan Yang Gu have put together. And here's an example of, of domain A where we've got, this is a process that we follow. We have images, they have little boxes drawn around them and we're basically trying to work out how to detect heads. And so we train them and we build a detection model. And if it works really well, it'll look like this. We'll, we'll find all of those boxes on, on, on an, an image from that same domain. But if we put it in another domain and you can see these images look quite different, the heads are white, the situation is a different picture, then it might fail. And what we're then trying to do is say, well, let's try to train these images to understand from domain A to understand these images from domain B. For, in this case, these images are from the experiments and the others are from Purdue. And the nice thing about this is if we, if we turn UQ in images into things that look like um, Purdue images, then we've already got them labeled. So we increase the number of labeled data sets and we, we in these by using essentially domain A um, labels that we've put into domain B images. So we've, it's the same technology that you will have heard about if, if you're worried about YouTube, um, you know, videos that have been doctored or perhaps I'm being doctored right now, um, but it's the same technology is being applied here. But the idea is that you retrain the model and if it works, you get a much better performance. And if it doesn't work, you end up, whoops, you end up with the same errors that we had before 
where your model failed. But in fact, we've just been doing some more work in this space recently in the last few, few weeks and um, it seems to be working quite well. We're starting to be able to count sorghum heads in very diverse situations. Now we've got to get that working in wheat um, and we've only got 130,000 photos to work with, but we'll, we'll see how we go. Um, in the wheat head density, um, we've just published some work again with the French team at Arvalis and, and INRA and other colleagues around the world. Uh, we actually helped uh, set up a, a, national, a, a global competition. It was uh, run on Kaggle and that competition, we'll be publishing some of the results of that, but it helped us to understand some methodologies that people have, would try in such a competition and whether we could um, improve on what we were doing. We got some interesting findings on image augmentation, but most of it was just tricks. It wasn't, there weren't any massive breakthroughs. I think that our understanding at the moment is that GAN is probably the way that we're going to get our generalization to work better. And it seems to be working well for sort. So um, there's a few of these applications of machine learning and crop growth modeling and phenotyping. So estimation of crop parameters, whether we're counting or estimating other um, from uh, the decision tree regression or semantic segmentation. I didn't mention that, but that's another area that we're using in conjunction with the French team. We're trying to work out how to indirectly estimate other parameters. I, I left out some slides on where um, on reflectance that we're doing um, with a PhD student, Sophie Chen. And Sophie's working on linking AppSim to reflectance models, so the types of reflectance models that are used in remote sensing. And what we're trying to do with that approach is to build, use network models to invert um, the results of a, of a reflectance model um, of vegetation. So we can use AppSim to create vegetation, and then we can convert that vegetation to a reflectance model. And then we can take the reflectance data from that simulation and build a network model to try to reverse um, calculate things like leaf area index or parameters that are associated with leaf growth. So Sophie's um, got some really nice results in that space. We don't have a publication on it yet. We, we're still working through some of that. but that is an area where we can generate extraordinary amounts of data for people to look at um, inverse modeling uh, challenges. And I just mentioned briefly, and I don't have time to go into detail, but if you want to have a look at the talks from, from Mark Cooper and others um, as part of the coffee sets, then you can see a lot more about um, fitting feedstock models in genetic data. So I thought I'd just finish up, Graham, if I have a few, a couple of minutes on other adventures. Um, I've put this slide in here, which is a whole lot of links to YouTube videos. I might ask Tyne if, if perhaps she can attach that somehow in the, in my YouTube link perhaps. Um, but I had looked through some of the talks that other people were doing and there's some, Great talks, particularly from, well, Andres is a, a five-year-old one, if you want to see how we used to do the coffee talks. Um, Jan's done a really recent one, which is a great talk on predicting yield within the fields. Um, Barb's got a, a talk on the remote sensing, if you want to chase some of that down. I think I already mentioned Graham, Alex, Mark, uh, Christine's got a summary of the work in the COE. Uh, Daniela's work in, in statistical modeling. And there's a really great talk from Danny Cozzolino um, on sensing technologies in agri-food systems. And that's certainly an area that requires a lot of data science um, applications. And there's also an interesting talk from Aaron and, and Daniel Rodriguez on intensification in, in Africa and some of the types of approaches you can see that they've used to summarize survey data sets and other types of um, agricultural data. So if you want to learn a bit more about some of the stuff I talked about, um, we're running a, a project called Invider on 
which is a, a companion to a European project. So I don't take any license with this name. It was actually Innovations in Variety Testing in Europe. And I just changed it to an A because I was lazy and used the same name. Um, but there's a video and discussion about that on, on GRDC website if you want to look at that. Um, in terms of other projects that we're engaged in, um, Andres leads a project called CropFin, which involves partners in Melbourne and um, data farming, a company based in Toowoomba, as well as other partners. And one of the things that is going extremely well in that project is using machine learning for discriminating crop types. So using very large numbers of data sets, so up to sort of millions of pixels of satellite data classified by um, crop types, and then applying machine learning to the sequence of satellite signal through the season and to try to guess what, what crop type we have. And that's working really well. I might add, we've also got a citizen science project in that space that we're trying to get funded um, so that we can have grey nomads driving around the country identifying crops to help us um, uh, improve our satellite prediction model. And this last little graphic, um, which I've left running here, is another piece of work from, from Andres and, and his team with uh, Yan Zhao and, and Yifan Zain. And this work is in conjunction with maths and physics with Fred Rooster using um, Gaussian process regression to fit these image data for a single pixel and then um, taking derivatives of these to learn about how the crop's changing over time so that we can predict the phenology. I think if you remember, I said very early in the piece, we need to get the phenology right before we get anything else right. And this is technology that's helping to do this at a sort of a, a subfield scale. Um, two other crazy points. Um, and I just realized I've lost my chat. Um, Ag asked, I wanted to mention this work because Guido Zucon is doing a terrific. Um, interesting experiment on a well a project again in conjunction with GRDC to build a conversational uh, search engine and the idea of that is that this prototype system um, searches a digital library of 90,000 scientific articles as well as GRDC's uh, library resources and the idea is for it, it's kind of like a search engine for, or an interactive search engine for, for growers. And some of the ways that you might be able to um, improve this kind of approach is to have an audio and image search so that growers could use images or they could talk to the system rather than typing any question into it. And also it could be used as a way of handing over between um, the the bot and that's running behind it to an expert service like an agronomist. So it can serve as a broker between uh, the grower and the provider um, and helping to, to solve problems more quickly. And the last one, um, which is the only animal one that I put in here, but the reason it's in here is because we're interested in working a bit more in some of this space on traceability um, with other people around UQ. And um, Ryan Coe is uh, engaged in some work which is looking at traceability. So using image processing to trace um, meat cuts through uh, processing lines, for example, to ensure that consumers and buyers get exactly what they pay for. So that's sort of the end of the talk. Um, I put a couple of, well, my comments on resources are, if you don't know some people over in ITE and School of Math and Physics, get to know them or contact me and I'll help you find the right people. Um, there are some resources for meeting AI researchers in Queensland, um, at the Queensland AI Hub, and also um, fast.ai, which is a, a website that um, engages with the AI Hub, but <coughs> they've trained hundreds of thousands of people to learn ML skills. and. I heard a nice talk from Jeremy Howard last week, who, who's the person who, who designed uh, Fast.ai and he now lives in Brisbane and is working with the AI Hub as well. 
but Jeremy's a successful uh, sort of startup uh, AI guy who's been in the US for a few years and come back. But his his comments on uh, on this space are really that he thinks that a lot more of our uh, domain specialists like ourselves need to learn a, enough about machine learning so that we can help translate problems from our domain to machine learning problems so that we can work with people to solve these, these types of challenges. So I'm gonna end it there um, <coughs> with two promos, um, along with my list of lots of various collaborators and various projects. One is, if you're a data scientist and you want a challenge, we just started the Global Wheat Challenge 2021. So that's the link to that. The competition ends on the 4th of July. So it only started last week. So if you want to get in and um, do better than anyone else, go for it. Um, people who work with me aren't allowed to compete. So I have to tell my team they can't do it, but everyone else in UQ can compete if they want. Um, and of course, outside UQ. And also the Brisbane Street Art Festival goes for another week. So if you want to go and look at some street art, they're in locations all around town. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Scott. That's uh, certainly um, a lot of adventures. So we're into the Q&A session and so hopefully um, there'll be some nice questions coming forward here but while we're waiting for a couple Scott I, I've always got one myself around this in that as a crop physiologist you you sort of tended to use crop physiology as a bridge between sort of you know some um, data science issue and and some solution to an agricultural sort of problem. Um, often you see in, in sort of publications that are using some of these uh, machine learning and AI techniques, the absolute absence of that bridge. Uh, mm -hmm. And so what do you think about that? Uh, do we need crop physiologists is what I'm asking. <laughs> I think we still got a job, Graham. So. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, I think it's useful and, and I mean, we can go back to have a look at some of those other talks. I, I think I listed one of the talks from, from Mark. I think it'd be a, a good one to go and watch, although that's not his most recent ones. He, he goes through some of those questions, but I, I, I think, and, and in, in your own talk, I think we are able to see one of the reason, one of the main reasons why we need to think about using deterministic models and perhaps hybrids with machine learning is that um, our deterministic models are more predictive. Uh, we can predict using future climate because we can predict into that space, whereas a lot of the machine learning techniques can't predict into completely new situations if there is a situation they haven't seen and they can fail. But one of the things that's worried me the most, and, and I've, I've come across it more than once in the last, um, year or two is when the, 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 there's a huge interest in ag tech of course there's a huge investment if you want to get depressed about our future you could you can do what i did and subscribe to ag funder and so every friday you receive an email from ag funder who they're very good emails about the, the situation in ag tech but usually it starts off with someone got 30 million dollars for doing something um, you got some background noise, mate. Um, <laughs> so, so someone just got thirty million dollars to do some crazy thing that, as a physiologist, you can't. That's not going to work. Um, so that, but, but the other thing that worried me is more in the remote sensing work because a lot of the remote sensing applications that we see that are trying to predict things like yields of wheat or, or stuff like that, or even some of the classification techniques particularly when they're dynamic, they're based off the kinds of algorithms that Facebook publish for sales. So uh, one example is t-shirt sales. So, you know, there are, there are annual variabilities in, in when t-shirts are sold and, and there are patterns in those. And so people think, oh, well, I can use those to predict crop yield because there are annual patterns in crop yield. And whatever. 
but t-shirts are not affected by droughts quite the same way that crops are so inserting the physiological understanding and it, and in the type of remote sensing prediction that Andres does and 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 with yourself inserting some crop physiological understanding between the weather data and the yield data actually starts to control the model so that it works within the physiological bounds of of sensibility so i guess that's my my main interest is in trying to use crop science to help us put boundaries around our understanding. Um, we're doing some similar things with uh, feature extraction from image data and so on. Yeah, it was a bit of a Dorothy Dixer, I, I suppose. Yeah. I, I'm, um, <laughs> I, I think there's, there's, there's lots of opportunity here for this domain exchange that you mentioned to sort of do things a lot better. So we've got a couple of questions on, on chat and I'll just um, relate those to you. So I suppose the first one, you just talked about um, the, the sort of phenotyping space and um, measurement. And someone asks here about um, sun-induced fluorescence data and whether you've thought about or looked at that in terms of phenotyping. Um, I see that from Will Woodgate. I, I think, Will, that'll be, I'm not directly, but it's something that uh, Andres Potgieter is particularly interested in with the hyperspectral sensing that we're doing in the field, we're able to detect the wavelengths um, that are, are related to sun-induced fluorescence. Um, and so there's certainly some active work going on in that space trying to work out whether we can, we can estimate that. Um, we've had a few exchanges with um, uh, Francisco Pinto at CIMIT in Mexico, who's got some nice work in that space. And we just haven't, I guess we haven't had a project to develop that too far just a minute, but there's some things going on. And I think um, there's a more general question here from Jordan Panels. I, I think you addressed it to a degree, but maybe you could expand um, asking about how we should go about collaborating with a data scientist to analyze is agricultural slash materials data. So probably again, an issue that faces a lot of agricultural people where <laughs> yeah. they've got um, a specific issue and lots of data and not quite sure how to go about handling it. Yeah, yeah when, I, when I started putting this presentation together, I, I, I was actually thinking about that. And I thought, well, it's probably for a different presentation, but I think one of the things that's challenging Jordan will experience is that you need to be able to get your data into the right kind of formats to use any of these technologies and just understanding what types of data formats and whether your data needs to be labeled or not labeled and, and how a system might process it that becomes part of the, the, the challenge um, so trying to do the translation of your data into a translation of your domain and your data in your domain into the right format is, is actually part of your first problem. Um, in terms of engaging, I think um, there are some information, there's sort of some information uh, contacts at, at places like ITE and, and uh, SMP, so School of Maths and Physics. But one of the places that I have been talking to people a lot is at UQ, um, have a course called the Masters of Data Science and in that they have a capstone project and so we've been engaging um, a bit with that with that course. Um, Slava Weissman um, is one of the coordinators of that course at, at the School of Maths and Physics and that's been one of the ways that we've been engaging and, and trying to find people to collaborate with us is, is trying to find students through that course. And in fact, a couple of those students are now are working with us in some projects. Just as a follow up on that, um, do you think, I mean, in, in um, olden times, it used to be that it was important for all biological, agricultural scientists to learn statistics. Um, you know, do we, and, and and subsequently into computing. Um, are we now at a point where we ought to have um, machine learning courses for biologists at undergraduate level? 
Oh, I think so. <laughs> I think I it's know, actually, maybe it's already happening. I don't know. Uh, it's not, and and I think it's something that we're trying to push a little here. Um, there are there's at least one other university in Australia that's offering a, a sort of a digital ag type course. Um, but um, it's an area. That, that certainly, the Masters of Data Science is a way that an ag scientist graduate could could develop some skills in that space, and and, um, and and also looking at the fast AI courses is a way of getting some basic skills in it. I think it's important though to realise your limitations because it's going to be very hard to turn yourself into a full-on data scientist, just as it was always hard to just turn yourself into a full-on biometrician if you, if you didn't actually study biometrics through the fundamental principles. And there are dangers in, in not having good advice and, and training. So um, I think hybrid degrees and at least good exposure to understanding what problems are amenable to some of these approaches, that's, that's where it becomes important. It's just knowing when an approach might work or not, might not work. I mean, I'm no expert in any of this stuff, but I'm trying to work out how to understand when I need to ask for help and who to ask and how to make it progress. Okay, thanks. Look, we've, we've got a couple more questions, but um, I'm not sure we've got time to deal with them, seeing as it's already gone past one. They were related more specifically to technical issues around, around modelling. And perhaps um, you can take those responses offline, Scott, if that's appropriate. Yeah. Um, okay. I think we, we should just probably wrap up um, for today. And, and, yep. um, and so I'd, I'd just like to thank everybody um, for their attendance. Uh, maybe if you